of students, uh, I once again welcome you to this next presentation on modern Indian architecture. And today we will be starting with regard to the western architects in India, the impact of architects like Le Corbusier, Louis Kahn and Walter Gropius etc. on the architecture of India and particularly the deep impression they created in the minds of young Indian architects who had been educated in the west and had now come back to India and started practicing in India. Uh, not only them, but also architects who were in India, architects like the Architects United of Pune, I had mentioned about that earlier, who did not go out but studied in India. They also were deeply impacted by the architecture of these architects because they built major buildings and major, uh, for example, an entire city, Chandigarh, was built by Kurbuzier and it had a very deep impact on these people. So, coming to probably the greatest architect of the 20th century, Le Corbusier and uh, parallelly with architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Alvar Aalto, Eero Saarinen, these all have been at the forefront of the modernist architectural movement, but probably the one who ranks ahead of probably all the 20th century architects in terms of the expanse of his impact on archi modern architecture is Le Corbusier. His presence transformed modernist architecture in India and for the next two decades and as we will see in these presentations on Corbusier, his impact is being felt even today in modern architecture in India. And not only in India, but internationally, globally, his impact was felt and continues to be felt. His theories that he propounded with regard to architecture and urban planning continue to be explored, continue to be dissected, studied. There are uh, pros and cons to the views that he expressed through his works. And I believe that for quite a while to come, there will uh, be uh, a lot of portents will be there for their role in the education of uh, students, architecture students and planning students all over the world. Now, one of the strongest influences on post-independence Indian architecture was that of Le Corbusier. He was a French architect and you might have studied his contribution to uh, world architecture in the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere around the 1910s, the 1920s, when he came up with the laying the foundation of the RCC construction in housing. Uh, he came up with what was called as the domino system along with the, uh, an engineer, Max Dubois. And this uh, feature, this structure that he evolved uh, a series of columns and slabs and an RCC staircase. That simple model then became the foundation stone of the villas that he designed uh, and what he termed as the points of a new architecture. He began by giving fundamentally five points, graduating on to nine points. So, houses like the Villa Stein, the Villa at Garche and culminating with the Villa Savoy formed the basis of this new architecture that he propounded and his uh, strong ideas concerning prefabrication and standardization uh, that came out in, in a, a book that he wrote during that time where he talked about how once we identify the standard elements of any object, we can take that to perfection. For example, if there is the Greek temple and we identify its elements, the, the critical uh, elements in it that is the column with the base shaft and capital, the entablature and the pediment etc. Having identified them, the Greeks kept on taking the temple to perfection say uh, and for example, ending with the Parthenon. So, those elements identified earlier in the classical Greek temple was taken to perfection. So, he then he gave the parallel example of the automobile the most, one of the most iconic uh, products that came out and that has radically transformed uh, our lifestyle and our cities, uh, the way we commute. And so, he took the example of the Ford automobile and he showed how from the early beginnings of the Ford automobile, how the car has evolved with time. 
and he only gave the example of the transformation of Ford because that was what was in front of him during those years and he said when we identify the car with its engine, its chassis, steering wheel, accelerator, brake, clutch, etc., having done that we can take these elements to perfection. So what he was doing was he was explaining to us that there are these modular components uh, or these standard components and then we can take them to perfection. He said a similar thing can be done in housing, in, in houses and he, he, may, he gave a dictum a house is a machine for living and he said a house is a machine for living with hot and cold water and with, uh, with the, with the uh, sunlight and uh, various other uh, uh, features uh, within the house, it is a machine for living. So, Everything is a machine, a machine for shaving for example, a machine for writing, a machine for typing, a machine for uh, working on your, uh, uh, your soft skills like a computer. So these are all machines and according to him in the same way a house is a machine for living and having identified the points of this new architecture, he said these five points are. The first of all the pilotus, the RCC grid, uh, the columns or the pilotus are the uh, foundation of the RCC frame along with the slabs and then the pilotus leads us to a free plan because the entire structure is standing on a frame. Therefore, the plan can be free, the walls internally are non-load bearing and you can place them as you want, you can curve them, you can remove them, you can give a puncture in the building, it does not impact the building per se because it is standing on a frame, in this case the pilotus and the slabs. And then the free facade in which the front facade of the building can be radically restructured because the outer wall is not carrying any load, it is a curtain wall. So, because of that it is a thin membrane and so he proposed the third thing, so the fourth thing rather, so pilotus, the free plan, the free facade and the ribbon windows that means windows from end to end clearly indicating that the outer wall is only a curtain wall. Later on this would go on and be expanded much further in for example the Bauhaus where the entire wall of the workshop wing was in glass as uh, done by Walter Gropius and so the idea of curtain wall really caught on particularly in skyscrapers. The fifth point was um, the roof garden. So according to him, now the reason for that was that they were having this row housing for example in Paris and if the garden was at the ground level, you would not have much of a view because there would be uh, houses in front of you. So he said let us reconfigure the house and it is easy to do that because now it is completely free with regard to the walls etc. So he shifted the, the, uh, the garden on the terrace. So the house begins by the initial facilities at the ground level, then the living facilities or the, the, the living room facilities say for example on the first floor level uh, as in Villa Savoy and then there is the roof garden at the top. So there from there you can have a vastly different view of the uh, surrounding landscape and uh, a distant view towards the horizon. He later on added four more points to that, that of the scissor staircase, the ribbon window, the curved bathroom etc. And he built on this idea and this concept in his later works also, which had undergone a radical transformation with his adoption of brutalism. So I believe uh, you, you need to go back and read some articles on the works of Courbusier so that when you see this presentation today, that work will supplement the understanding of what I am teaching you today. So just to give you a, a glimpse, he has begun with the five points of a new architecture and in the villas that he designed and this was the foundation of the international style. This was pure geometrical forms in white planes with these uh, ribbon windows and the outer walls being curtain walls, the, the, the building being held on a structural frame, in this case RCC, in the case of Mies it was in steel and this is the example of the Villa Savoy. But as time passed by and especially after the end of the second world war, he gradually moved on to more rugged buildings like the Rondcham Chapel at Notre Dame in France. 
And this was a phase where he started coming up with more rugged sculptural forms. Now, if you look at the building from the outside, it appears as if this is not having the original credentials that are there in the Villa Savoy, but that is not true. Because this building, though sculptural in its appearance and having these uh, uh, rugged walls and this uh, inverted parasol roof on the top, is still following the principles of a framed construction. It is still having, so inside is a vast uh, uh, hall for the chapel and uh, it has been amazingly done, you need to read more about it. And then he went on to the juxtaposition of pure forms as you see here in the monastery La Torre with cylinder, cone and cubes being more combined together. But in a sense, the idea of a pilotus, the idea of a, of a, of, of a framed structure, the idea of a outer curtain wall continued to be here. Now, the only way you can actually understand their presence is if you understand the beginning of the architecture of Corbusier. If you understand this, then you can see that the ideas are conceptually there even in this. Particularly one building that you need to study and that is unite the habitation, it is united habitation, a, a collective housing complex, multi-storied building, one single building that he designed in Marseille in France. And this building had housing units for the people, it had a shopping complex, it had even a small hotel, it had a play school at the terrace and it had um, even an open air theater at the terrace. So, the terrace which is the roof garden in Villa Savoy became a much more complex series of activities like the play school, the open air theater, a jogging track etc. on this vast building. And then the pilotus at the ground level became very heavy pilotus or pilotus tapered columns in raw concrete, what he called as beat or brute. And this raw concrete was uh, given the pattern of the shuttering material and once the shuttering was taken off, the pattern, rem pattern remained. You can see that here also to a certain degree in Monastery La Touré and this also has been done in raw concrete or beton brut. So, United Habitation had all those principles that he had developed uh, during the earlier uh, points of a new architecture and uh, this evolution took place and he moved away from what was very fine planes to a more rugged sculptural form and pure geometry. Now, in a very amazing way, this turned out to be very, very fortunate for India because this kind of rugged work was ideally suited for Indian conditions where the construction material was not of the same quality. The labor force that we had, our sites were more labor intensive and not me mechanically intensive and therefore, the work could not have the same fine finish as for example, you could have in buildings like this and many other buildings that were coming up in Europe at the time. So, by doing what he did for certain reasons in United Habitation and in Monastery La Torre, in the Ron Sham Chapel, he developed a completely new vocabulary and when he landed in India to begin working on Chandigarh, he brought that vocabulary along with him and completely transformed the way we look at monumental buildings uh, at the time. So, his coming to India, his work had already shifted from the geometric simplicity of the international style to a more rugged sculptural and geometric forms of brutalism. He was hired in 1950 along with his cousin Jean-Pierre Jeanneret and the British couple Maxwell, uh, Fry and Jane Drew to design Chandigarh and he worked in Chandigarh extensively designing the buildings of Chandigarh along with his entire team and he also worked in Ahmedabad and made a series of vitally important and iconic buildings. I would not even call them iconic, I will call them conceptually vital for modern architecture. So great was the impact of these architects, not only on young Indian architects, but globally that Chandigarh turned out to be a kind of what you might call a architectural pilgrimage for architectural students and even Ahmedabad. Houses like the Villa Shodan, the Sarabhai house and the entire capital complex in Chandigarh are must study for students of architecture if they want to understand the fundamental principle of modern principles of uh, modern architecture in the 20th century. Most of the architecture that we see today, I am of the viewpoint that much of it continues to have the same 
foundation as the architecture of the mod modernist and the international style and the uh, distributaries that came out of that. So, the work of Chandigarh and Ahmedabad added a whole new dimension to the modern Indian architectural experience. Kabuzir was responsible for the general outlines of the master plan of Chandigarh and the creation of the monumental buildings of what came to be known as the capital complex. So, in the planning of Chandigarh, the initial plan that you see on your left, more like a fan shaped plan was given by Albert Mayer and Matthew Nowicki which was loosely curving system. They were both American architects and they gave a loosely curving system instead of a geometric grid. Now, this was a little strange because the American architects were would have been more in tune with the grid iron pattern of design as had already been done in New York and Chicago. By an act in 1785, the United States of America had been converted into a grid iron planning pattern and they were coming from America, but having come to Chandigarh, they gave a completely different curving or a fan shaped plan. Unfortunately, in 1950, Matthew Nowicki died in a plane crash and Albert Mayer withdrew from the uh, design of Chandigarh. In stepped Corbusier with the uh, strong support of Jawaharlal Nehru. In 1950, 52, he changed this plan from this curving system to a rational orthogonal grid. This was the new vision for Chandigarh. The park network that Mayer and Nowicki had uh, provided uh, which followed the natural contours and water courses of the site of Chandigarh, Corbusier converted that in completely and on that flat site he made the road straight. Now to give you a comparison between the various city plans, if you look at Chandigarh and then you look at the plan of Jaipur by I believe Raja Jai Singh and you find that the same orthogonal grid and sectoral planning arrangement is followed there also. Did Corbusier get influenced by that? I cannot say for sure, but there seems to be a very close link between the two. Of course, uh, because of the, the way the site was where Jaipur had been put, one of the sectors so to speak in this part was taken away and it was added here. We will see more about this when we look at the design of Jawahar Kala Kendra by Charles Correa, where the same idea uh, the, the planning of the Vastu Purusha Mandala has been utilized by him. Then there is the plan of the capital of Odisha Bhubaneswar by Otto Konisberger and if you link, if you see this plan like a fan, one part of a fan and then you see this plan, this is the plan of Brasilia by Lucio Costa and the buildings were designed by Oscar Nimaya. So, there is a, a kind of a connect between at least three modern plans and one traditional Indian plan. Now, the idea of Chandigarh actually sprang from Corbusier's idea of urban planning called the Ville Reduce, uh, that is the radiant city and he came up with that in 1927. It was a series of identical monolithic blocks in vast green belts and the blocks could be as high as 200 meters high and they were linked with high speed expressways as you see in this sketch and these monolithic blocks on either side. They, it was a supremely rational environment. He did that because once these blocks come up, vast amount of green space is available which can be, uh, so it can be a very dense green area in which these blocks are rising up. But these anonymous blocks proved to be very repetitive and they denied individuality. This plan never came up anywhere in the world, but Corbusier did get an opportunity to execute his ideas of urban planning or city planning in Chandigarh and Chandigarh turned out in a sense to be a low rise villa reduce or radiant city. So, the Corbusier and his team replaced the super blocks of the radiant city with the geometric matrix of generic neighborhood units called sectors. Now, the, there is a biological analogy behind the sectors. Chandigarh is conceived as analogous to the human body. The head is the capital which is here, that is sector 1. The heart 
which is the city center, the, so, the hub of the, uh, the socio-cultural activity of the city, sector 17. Then there are the lungs, which is the leisure valley, the open spaces and the green areas in the sectors. Then the intellect are the cultural and educational institutions. The circulatory system is the V1 to V7 road network and the viscera is the industrial area. Now, Corbusier identified four basic functions that a city should have. It should have living, working, circulation and the care of body and spirit. Living, working, circulation and the care of body and spirit. According to him, circulation is of great importance because it connects all the remaining three, living, working and the caring of the body and spirit and he determined, so they connect, he, it connects all the remaining three. City plan, a general city was planned which could be placed on a flat piece of land. Now, Mayor and Nowicki had done exactly the same thing. The only thing they did was that they turned it into a curved or a fan shaped plan. Corbusier modified that, made it orthogonal. This was planned for about 150,000 inhabitants, 150,000 people to go on to a final stage of around 5 lakh or 500,000 people. Sectors. The f in the first phase, there was going to be 30 sectors. So there were 30 sectors. Each sector is 1,000 by 800 meters, having housing, shopping, community facilities, schools, places of worship, and leisure. This is the way the sectors have been laid out. This is the example of one particular sector and the way it has been put together. It's a it's a typical sector uh, of Chandigarh. Now there are longitudinal parks that are running through and through the sectors. And then there are the bazaar streets that are running perpendicularly to them and cutting across the center of these sectors. And within the sectors are neighborhoods. The entire circulation structure of V1 to V7 each gives an idea of roads graduating from the, 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 the smallest ones at V1 to the, the, the widest ones which are between sectors and in the city, the V7s. The capital complex, which is the heart of uh, or rather the head of Chandigarh was around, designed around an open plaza and we will discuss more about that, but just to give you an idea of the various buildings which you would have uh, seen before, there is most of all, uh, the, there is the assembly building there is the secretariat building behind it. Then there is the palace of justice or the high court building. At this side is the uh, hall of shadows, the tower of shadows. Then there is the governor's palace which was never built, it, it is unbuilt. There is the monument of the martyrs and there is the open hand. So, these buildings or these uh, features define this open plaza and the open plaza connects all of them together. Now, this is the aerial view of the capital complex looking from the assembly building towards the uh, high court building. Uh, if you can just go back again from here to here towards the high court building on this side is the uh, monument of martyrs. So, if you look at here, very, very, uh, uh, this is a very vast landscape of uh, uh, rolling hills and vast green areas and you have this, uh, uh, the, the monument of martyrs and again, if you look at it from the other side, there is the uh, assembly building and there is the secretariat building behind it. This is the monument of martyrs and here you have the tower of shadows. So, here it is again. Now, the the, though the plaza is extensive, uniting the buildings together, it also has a major cross axis running like this. Now, there is a fundamental difference between this cross axis and the axial planning that you find, for example, in Delhi. If you look at the capital complex and compare it with Latyan's Delhi, capital complex is a modernist version of Latyan's Delhi. New Delhi, which is colonial, is organized around a major axial road. This is the axial road. This is the Rajpath. You have the, um, the India Gate towards this side. You have the Rashtrapati Bhavan and you have the, sec uh, the Secretariat, the Central Secretariat, North and South Block. Whereas in the capital complex, which is modernist, it is organized around this pedestrian plaza. And then you have the assembly building akin to 
the other monumental building in Raj, uh, at Rajpath, the Rashtrapati Bhavan. What it should have been, the, the parallel building should have been the governor's palace, but it never came up. But then there is the secretariat building, which is parallel to the secretariat of Delhi and so on and so forth. Now, the again if you look at the aerial views of the two, it is very clear to us that we are talking about a very strong central axial symmetry with both the, secret, uh, the secretariats on either side with the Rashtrapati Bhavan bank at the, at the end of that uh, axis and these buildings on either side are symmetrically most of, all, most, of all, most of them are symmetrically organized whereas here we have a vast open plaza and it is not a rigid symmetry. Again in this case in, in Delhi, the secretariat is in the foreground of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. In Chandigarh, the secretariat is behind the assembly building. In the comparison of buildings the, between capital complex and Rajpath, like Latians, Kurbuzir also achieved a sense of architectural monumentality. But the difference being that Lutians went the way of the neoclassical uh, neoclassical architecture with traditional Indian elements. Kurbuzir went completely modernist in a brutalist format. Now there is also a comparison with regard to modern uh, with regard to Mughal architecture that is derived from Mughal architecture. Some critics say there is a close link between the overall site site layout of the capital complex with that of the overall broken symmetries of the hierarchical set of spaces of Fatehpur Sikri. In Fatehpur Sikri, the spaces have a sense of hierarchy. So, there are a series of these spaces that you see here and they are, there is a broken symmetry and there seems to be a connect between the two. Let us look at this. If you look at the aerial view, this is the view of the entire plaza with these buildings uh, placed at different points. This is where the governor's palace should have been, it is not there and this is the, uh, the, ta the tower of shadow somewhere here and here you have the, uh, the uh, monument of Martyrs. whereas here you have Fatehpur Sikri flowing like this. The plaza itself is vast and extensive, in fact is, it is very bare, there is no tree or greenery, greenery that comes in front of any buildings, it may be on the on the side but not in front. One of the things that the plaza is doing is that it is giving you a spectacular view of the entire assembly building on the entire high court building and from a distance the entire view of the secretariat building. In fact, the whole building is framed in view, behind it are the rolling hills of this, this region and the surrounding vast green landscape and the buildings are framed in that. And the plaza per se does not give a strong axis, but gives a fantastic view of the building. Now to maintain this view, no tree, no greenery or no element is planted in front of them. So in that case, this turns out to be very controversial because Chandigarh becomes very, very hot in summers and this plaza becomes counterproductive with regard to climate. Now the assembly building which was completed in 1964, this again shows the derivation from Mughal architecture if you compare it with the hall of public audience in at Red Fort in Delhi and if you look at the overall massing of this building with that of the assembly building and all you see is that this is a modernist version of a similar idea. If you look at the ideas being carried forward from his early years, then in the assembly building, you do find the pilotus, here, here is the pilotus inside the assembly building. In fact, this outside is also a form of pilotus, but it has become a flat slab pilotus. Then you have the beton brut or the raw concrete, both in the assembly building, in the secretariat building and the other buildings of the capital complex. So, if you try to compare uh, the plans itself, this is the plan of Villa Savoy and you see that it is on a grid of pilotus and so also is the plan of the assembly building on a dense grid of pilotus, but the pilotus have uh, undergone change instead of being uh, white uh, plastered and uh, fine finished, these are in beton brut. Then there is the sense of classical symmetry, not only is the assembly building as I told you comparable to that Mughal architecture at the red fort, it is also comparable in its overall uh, uh, form. The Greek temple 
and then if you move on in the timeline to the Alte Museum by Karl Friedrich Schinkel, we have seen this uh, 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 comparison earlier with regard to another set of uh, buildings and then there is the Crown Hall by Mies van der Rohe, there is the new National Gallery by Mies van der Rohe in the 1950s in Berlin and then you have the assembly building. So what Mies was achieving in glass and steel, Corbusier was achieving in exposed RCC and Corbusier was uh, whereas in this case there is maximum exposure to the sun because it is a cold climate in Chandigarh he gives deep loggias and verandas and vast sun shades over the building to keep out the hot sun. As you can see the entire facade of the building is in complete shade whereas in Crown Hall for example it is not at all in shade it is completely up front because you want to pull in the sun into the building. Now, the secretariat building was completed in 1953, again you find Beton Brut in the various uh, images of this and here you see that how the entire secretariat building is also framed in the landscape at on, on a different road uh, uh, towards the side of the capital complex. A comparison between United you know, Habitation and the secretariat building is in two ways. The secretariat building is a very close derivation of United you know, Habitation both in form in the overall mass of the building as well as in the use of beton brut, expo, uh, raw concrete. So we will stop here with this series of uh, beginning of the, the study of Chandigarh and I will then uh, in the next presentation take you again to Chandigarh and we will revisit some of the buildings and draw up certain derivations and comparisons from there. Thank you.